Well, good evening to all of you across Indonesia joining us for this uh, late session of the European Research Days 2020 Indonesia. My name is Susanne Ranzavaso. I'm the regional representative of Euraxis ASEAN, and I'm very happy to welcome so many of you this evening for this session on research opportunities in the Netherlands. We have a fa fabulous panel ahead of us. And before I hand over to our moderator tonight, Mr. James Zulfa, who's joining us from Jakarta, I want to just briefly share with you a little bit of information about Euraxis, the uh, project I'm representing, um, to help you with your career development. Now, Euraxis is a pan-European project. It is supported by the European Commission, but most importantly, it is a project by over 40 European countries. And what they want to do is really make it easy for mobile researchers like yourselves to spend some time in Europe to develop your research career. So Euraxis is an internet portal where in one convenient location you'll find all the instruments, all the support you need to have to develop your research career in Europe or with European collaborators. Most of you will be most interested, of course, in finding out about job opportunities, funding opportunities, and we have our funding portal where on a daily basis you find thousands of offers, be it research uh, positions, fellowship, funding opportunities, all across Europe and all across these countries that are partner countries of Europe. We also have a partnering tool, which I think will be particularly useful to early career researchers who are trying to establish a research network. So you can use this tool to search for other researchers in your field, maybe to reach out to universities in Europe if you're trying to establish a partnership of sorts. You can also reach out to companies that are part of this growing Euraxis network. Another very interesting and important feature is our hosting database. Now, the hosting database gives you concrete offers of supervisors and institutions in Europe that are looking to hire research talent to spend some time at their institution to do a PhD or maybe to do some postdoctoral research. Again, for those of you that are just starting out your career, this is a wonderful opportunity to identify um, your career path. Now Europe is huge, the European research area is huge, there's lots of information that I'm sure you'd be interested in, who is doing research in Europe, who are the main players, who are the funding agencies, and you find all that on our Euraxis website, and we have a specific country page for each of the Euraxis member countries, including, of course, the Netherlands. You will find a website dedicated specifically to information related to research in the Netherlands. And what you also find is personalized assistance, and I think this is what makes this such a unique project. We have Euraxis service centers all across Europe with real people that are there to assist you with your mobility experience, but maybe also to give you some advice if you're trying to identify collaborators. As I said, I'm part of Euraxis ASEAN. We have Euraxis worldwide colleagues all across the globe. Uh, I am based in Singapore. I'm also in charge of Indonesia and Malaysia, and you can always contact me if you like to get uh, additional information. And here, this wonderful QR code will lead you to our website. Our website details information that are particularly relevant to researchers here in Southeast Asia and in Indonesia. Um, and I invite you to explore the many opportunities for you to um, join into our activities. Of course, currently we're right in the middle of our 2020 European Research Days in Indonesia. Lots is still ahead, um, but we have plenty of other um, events up our sleeves, so please do check in regularly and join us. And with this, enough from me, because I know you're here to hear from our experts about research in the Netherlands, and with this, I will hand over to James Zulfan. I know James because not only is he an alumnus of TU Delft, 
but he has also been awarded the Euraxis Prize last year for his excellent science communication skills. But maybe, James, you want to say a few words about yourself. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Suzanne. So, hi, everyone. Good evening. Selamat malam. So, yeah, it's been a pleasure to moderate uh, again the European Research Day 2020 with focus on the Netherlands. So, yeah, as, in, as introduced by Susan, my name is James Zulfan, and currently I am working at the Ministry of Public Works and Housing of Indonesia. And, yeah, speaking of the Netherlands, I was a student worthy in 2014 for workshops in the Netherlands, and after that, uh, followed by a master program uh, in 2015 at IHC Delft Institute, uh, and it's sponsored by the NFP uh, fellowships, which both are program from Nufik Meso, and I'm thankful for that. And yeah, last year, I also traveled back again to the Netherlands because I won the uh, Euro Access Prize in 2019, which allowed me to visit the European Research Institute to gain some network and research collaborations with uh, some top uh, leading research institute uh, uh, in Europe. So I would say that the Netherlands has an excellent uh, research infrastructure that can help us to improve and to grow our research career. So to have more in-depth uh, knowledge about uh, conducting research in the Netherlands, uh, we will hear further from our panelists. So I am, uh, welcome our panelists uh, who are already joining with us today. So our first speaker is Dr. Peter Van Tuil. Dr. Peter is the director of the Novik Neso Indonesia. Good evening, Dr. Peter. Hello. And thank you. And our second speaker is Professor Dr. Ronald Holzacker from University of Groningen. Professor Holzacker is the founder and director of Groningen Research Center for Southeast Asia and ASEAN. Good evening, Professor Holzacker. Yeah, and our third speaker is Professor Arnold Tucker from Leiden University. Professor Tucker is the director and head of the Department of Industrial Ecology, Institute of Environmental Sciences, CML. Good evening, Doctor. Yeah, good evening, good Professor evening. Tucker. Hello. <laughs> yeah, so we will hear uh, the presentation from all panelists first, and then we will have a discussion sessions afterward. And since this is an interactive webinar, so you are most welcome, all the participants, to ask uh, relevant questions to our panelists. So please type your uh, questions uh, inside the questions box. Type your question and if it's possible to also write to whom you want to ask your questions. It will be helpful since we have more than one panelist here. Okay, uh, so now we shall begin our first presentations. Uh, our first presentation is from Dr. Peter, who will give us an overview of conducting research and also funding availabilities in the Netherlands. So without further ado, Dr. Peters, time is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Suzanne. Thank you very much, uh, James. Good evening, Selamat malam to the Glapti Indonesia. Uh, very happy to see you, uh, even though I cannot meet you in person. And I'm happy to give you some general information about research in the Netherlands and what else can we do than start with the picture of happy researchers and students in a field of flowers. It is a cliche, but it is also true in the Netherlands, uh, the country of the flower industry in, uh, in Europe. Um, and one remark in advance, because I know that a lot of people uh, will be interested in this. Uh, what is the situation with regard to uh, the pandemic uh, COVID-19 in the Netherlands and what are the implications uh, for researchers? Uh, the Netherlands uh, is affected by Corona 
uh, there's a number of uh, public uh, health measures in place which look a lot like those in Indonesia. Keep distance, wash your hands, wearing masks uh, in the public domain will soon be uh, an obligation. Um, the good news is that uh, there is a special channel for visa for students and uh, since last week also for researchers. So if you are working uh, in a, an approved research project, you can go to the Netherlands and you can do your work as a researcher. Uh, there is no principal impediments to do that. So that as a start, because this is the situation at the moment. Uh, why the Netherlands? Um, in the, uh, I don't know if some of you have seen the opening session of this uh, research week. Uh, there you could already see uh, what you see in this slide also, that uh, Netherlands universities uh, rank high in general in the global rankings that are available. Uh, and Netherlands universities uh, have access to relatively a large number of grants uh, funded by the EU. Uh, the Netherlands produces comparatively a large number of scientific articles and as a result of that also uh, scientific citations. So the Netherlands is a country where you will find a lot of high quality research. This is a, a basic overview of uh, the Dutch research system and Dutch research institutions universities, universities, research universities, universities of applied sciences. There are some specific uh, research institutions, some national knowledge institutions. Uh, this presentation will be available online later on, so you don't need to take notes if you're interested in this. There is uh, three basic flows of funding in support of research. There is direct government funding to uh, universities. There is a second flow of funding that uh, goes via the Dutch Organization for Scientific Research, NWO, and the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences, KNAW. They tender their research projects and you and you or your institution can uh, participate uh, in submitting proposals. And then there is a third flow, which is mostly uh, has to do with European funding, uh, for example, under FP7 and, of course, under Horizon 2020, which soon enough will be Horizon 2025. Um, then uh, here is some overview of uh, NVO's, uh, NWO's role in research funding. Uh, it is supported uh, primarily by the Ministry of Education, but also receives support from the Ministry of Economic Affairs and from other line ministries and private sector organizations. Uh, funding goes sometimes directly to universities, to the NVO Institute and other knowledge institutions. And as I said, a lot of NVO funding is available uh, via tender processes. This is uh, the website. The website also has uh, an elaborate English version. Uh, you can find opportunities for funding in the NWO website uh, based on various uh, thematic entry points. They have a relatively easy search function. So that's one option to look for possible funding. This is a, a screenshot of the KNAW website. Same story here, you find easy accessible information about possible funding uh, and also thematically organized to help you finding your way. Um, some uh, key remarks about uh, pursuing a PhD in the Netherlands. Normally it is, uh, uh, you need four years minimum to conduct original research and writing your dissertation. Uh, that is, of course, sometimes can be a bit longer. Uh, what makes the Netherlands different from many other countries is that in many cases, a PhD program is not regarded as a study program, but as a job. Uh, you will get a contract of work with a university, and these positions are advertised as such. 
and also your visa for the Netherlands will not be a student visa, but it will be a work visa. So this is different from if you pursue an MA in the Netherlands, then you receive a student visa. In most cases, uh, if you conduct a PhD with a Netherlands University or Research Institute, you, you have a job. Uh, and that is offered by in universities and research institutes. Uh, so you can be employed. You can, of course, also come in with your own research grant. And sometimes people can do a PhD next to your job. Um, here you have, sorry, I'm going backwards. Um, this is uh, the two major websites where you find all of the available opportunities, factcards.nl and academictransfer.nl. Uh, here you see a screenshot of the Fact Cards website. Uh, again, the Fact Cards website has information also about living in the Netherlands, working in the Netherlands, and so more than just uh, studying or doing a PhD. Uh, and then you see the groupings in different topics, kind of research and different options. Academic Transfer also has an easy, accessible and searchable website. Uh, you can type in the scientific field that you're interested in and then see what kind of positions are available to which you can apply. Uh, academic Transfer also organizes uh, PhD recruitment events. This is uh, something coming up in China. Uh, this is, of course, uh, because of COVID-19, all done online. Uh, so from 20 to 22 November, uh, on the Academic Transfer website, you can see the information how uh, you can meet particular professors interested in recruiting new PhD researchers. Any more information, here is uh, our phone numbers, our Facebooks and our uh, social media accounts. Again, this presentation will be available online uh, after this uh, meeting. Uh, so don't worry uh, if uh, the slides pass by quickly, the information will be available for you. And feel free to contact us uh, if you have any further questions. Thank you very much, back to you. James. Okay, Dr. Peter, uh, thank you for your interesting presentation. I love the fake card uh, website. I already checked the, the website. It is very informative and very useful for the one who uh, wants to know more about uh, research in the Netherlands. So we shall move on to our second speaker. Uh, now it's time for Professor Holzacker who will share on how to prepare a good research proposal. So this is actually very important, especially for uh, those who are looking for PhD positions in the Netherlands. So Professor Holzacker, whenever you are ready, time is yours. Thank you very much, uh, James. And uh, thank you also, Peter, to give the sort of institutional uh, uh, framework um, that the Dutch universities work within. I really love the field of flowers at the beginning because now we, of course, have entered fall here in the Netherlands. It's raining outside. And what's, of course, very interesting about flowers that grow from bulbs is we have to put them in now in the fall, in the rain and almost frozen soil, and then they come up in the springtime. And I think that's also what research is really about before we start writing then there is this long period of of research and that's like really getting your hands uh into the dirt and working the soil um so i think the analogy of the dutch uh, bulbs um and the flowers in our own front yards and backyards are really part of that uh, is my screen being uh, my powerpoint being shown right now Yes. 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 Okay. So I don't see it. My oh, I see it over here now. Okay. Um. I don't see it moving to the next screen.
Um, So I'm not sure what I need to do in order to move to the next slide. Uh, here's my suggestion. If you just briefly send it to me via email and maybe we have Professor Tucker's presentation first and then I will show it from my screen. Does that make sense? Perfect, thank you. Okay, yeah, okay, that's, that's fine. Then we shall uh, move to Professor Tucker. So mm -hmm. Professor Tucker will share us uh, about uh, how it's like to conducting PhD in the Netherlands. <clears throat> so yeah, Professor Tucker now will share his screen. Okay. Yep. Great. So Professor Tucker, time is yours. Yeah, thank you. So I assume you will all see it now and I will go down to the next one. Well, this is a very dense slide with a very dense presentation. Uh, the slides will be available for all of you on the on the website of you to access. Uh, so you can read it. And actually, this slide already tells the story of uh, Dr. Peter, uh, that you have two ways of enrolling in a PhD program in the Netherlands. Uh, either you have projects that create jobs and you can apply for a job, but it's very competitive. I have often 20, 30 people competing for one place. And so the vast majority of people that we get in my institute as a PhD from Indonesia or from China, they get a stipend from their government. And once you get the stipend, you have to get it, but then you have the money to do your research. Um, also a little bit about the project proposal. Uh, how we work is that we actually try to find the right people that fit with my institute and that are really good quality. And then based on the interest of the PhD person and the interest of the institute, we actually co-develop the research proposal. So doing a lot of work on your own research proposal before you approach a professor, that is a little bit too much. I would rather say, think about your, uh, for yourself, what are interesting topics and that you can write it out maybe in five lines and then start a discussion with a potential professor that works in your field and is interested to host you. And then jointly, you co-develop the proposal. And usually I see, if you look at it in a proper way, I see in China and also in Indonesia, we have something like a 70, 80% success rate uh, when people go for stipends. So let's now assume that uh, we are successful. Someone has a stipend or you got a job. How does it work? at least in my university, but that I would say in Leiden, that is very similar to any university. You have a formal registration in the graduate school. The graduate school actually has to check the diploma, because diploma that gives you access to a PhD has to be equivalent to a master degree obtained from a European university. I would say all the top universities in Indonesia, like uh, Universitas Indonesia, Universidad Padilla, Bandung Institute for Technology, UGM, and various others, they are good quality. And usually, if you have a diploma from these universities, not any problem. Once you're registered, formally a professor and a supervisor is appointed. You write a detailed research submission plan, and then you start your research. Usually this research is about four years. Uh, and what I see, it depends on the subject. I have people that spent the four years in my institute in the Netherlands. I also have people that say, no, I want to do practical research in a country of origin. And then it's a bit more split. People that stay, for instance, the first year, about nine months with us, to develop a research methodology, to plan the practice work. And then they go back maybe to Indonesia and do a lot of practice work. They come back again, write their papers, and that's how it goes. Now, <clears throat> I think Dr. Peter already indicated as well, we treat PhDs not as students, but as employees. I always say, I have an institute of about 30 people. They are split between two groups, we call industrial ecology and environmental biology. Both groups have about 50 to 60 people. 
but 30 of them are PhDs, and they are just part of the group. Between 12 and 1, I just came out of my uh, weekly group meeting, and there we basically have 40 to 50 people in my group all together. The type of research that we do is, on the one hand, uh, environmental biology. That is a group, uh, if you have the picture on top, that looks at the green part. The green part is the natural system, biodiversity, natural capital. How does the natural system work? What kind of stresses from the economic system can it tolerate? And we do that via impact, uh, assessing the adaptation of the natural system and how that impacts ecosystem services. The other group, and that is my professorship, we look at the way how natural resources are used in the economy. And they talk about how can you use them as efficient as possible? How can you make a circular economy? How can you make sure that you use all these natural resources, including, of course, iron ore and bottle, in such a way that they create least impacts on the environment? Like I said, our PhDs are integral part of the groups. We don't make any difference between PhDs that happen to have a job and stipends. They are all employees. We have a lot of social activities. You see there a picture that we actually managed to uh, org uh, a meeting that we managed to organize in July when the COVID problems were a bit lower in the Netherlands. And you see there a band of musicians and they are all made up by a number of PhDs of my institute and with the senior staff. So we really try to create a good coordination between the PhDs, between our staff. We have a PhD committee with our own social activities. And of course, in COVID time, it's all a bit more complicated. So what is the PhD process and how do you graduate? In the Netherlands, a typical PhD is yeah, organized around four papers, scientific papers, around the coherent subject. And of course, they have to write an introduction in which you build up the research questions and you have to add a conclusion. So roughly, it is one paper per year. Ideally, these papers are published when you graduate. But if that is not possible, because the review process takes too, uh, too, many, too much time, I often have situations that two papers are published and we are confident that the other two papers will be published after a good review procedure. And then I approve the thesis. We typically have two supervisors for each PhD and a promoter. The promoter has to be a professor. The supervisor talk at least every two weeks with the PhD and the promoter at least joins every two months. We also try to cluster the PhDs in subjects to avoid that it really becomes a lonely exercise. The graduate school has a number of compulsory short courses on, for instance, science ethics. And the rest, it is not like in Finland, where you basically have to do from your four years of PhDs, you have to do one year courses we send people to courses in consultation with the PhDs. What do you need? So that can be a conference, that can be a dedicated course on the subject. After around four years, the PhDs should be ready. Then if I am your promoter, I approve your thesis. And that is actually the big thing. If I approve a thesis, that it's sent to a committee, a reading committee that has to approve the thesis. If the thesis that is rejected, I made the biggest mistake. I let the PhD manuscript go. That wasn't apparently not good enough. And I am the one responsible at that point. Once you have the approval of the committee, that is actually the big thing. But formally, you still have to make the formal defense. That is a 45 minute procedure where you sit in front of about six, seven professors that all get about five to ten minutes to really ask difficult questions. But I can guarantee you, if you keep on standing, you reply nicely, then after the defense, you get your PhD diploma because, yeah, you know, the manuscript actually was already approved before the defense. So then after the defense, you see this happy moment. Uh, that is a PhD ceremony we had uh, about uh, two or three weeks ago. 
and you graduate and you get a nice diploma. What are the typical research subjects that we have at my institute? The details are on in this leaflet, but please read it uh, when you download this presentation. We do work on ecotoxicology, both in the lab as in the field. We do biodiversity and ecosystem services research. We do research in environmental DNA. We do research <coughs> related to environmental and economic input output analysis and environmental footprinting. We do life cycle assessment and material flow analysis. And that to highlight, it is one of my last slides, a few of the examples of people that I had or still have in the Institute. The first person, Victor Pimana. He is from Umpat in Bandung and he works on economic and environmental accounts in Indonesia. That was quite interesting and I had my shocking moments when I learned to know him and his supervisor in Indonesia. His supervisor in Indonesia was at that moment a professor at Umpat called Amira Ali Shibana. And I had no clue that when we met, I learned she had been the minister of Umpapinas of your country. And I saw her actually move into Bangkok. She is now the secretary general of ESCOM, so a very high ranked person. And I must say, a very pleasant person to work with. We are really good friends. The second person from Umpat is Irlan Anjatjan Roon. He started with us about a year ago, and he is really fabulous, making big databases, input output databases of Indonesia and the world. And he looks at the international value chains of palm oil. If, yeah, uh, how that influences jobs and value added production in Indonesia. One of our former students, Eddie Veloso, he is now working with Lippi, he did life cycle assessments of bioenergy. We had P3 who came from Kalimantan and he analyzed yeah, how to do sustainable forest management in Kalimantan. And he moved on to actually become a researcher in the Yale University program on biodiversity in Indonesia. And then we also had SPHD Ahmad Adisha, he is now working with Unilever Indonesia. And then that was another shocking moment when we prepared for his defense. It appeared that he was married to the granddaughter of your former president, Abibi. Abibi was in Germany when the PhD defense was there. And he came across. So yeah, we had the Indonesian ambassador, my rector, and all kind of people there. And it really was a pleasure to learn about him and, uh, and all things. I'm now coming at the end of my presentation. Uh, thanks for your attention. And here you see a number of photographs of your president visiting Leiden University during the state visit of, uh, uh, of Joko Widodo, uh, your president, to the Netherlands in 2016. Thanks for your attention. Okay, great. Thank you, Professor Tucker. Uh, for your inspiring presentations. So, yeah, uh, we hope that more of Indonesian will also came to join your group uh, in your institutions. <laughs> so, yeah. we will back to uh, Professor Holsecker. Uh, are you ready? So, yeah, okay. So, Professor Holsecker, time is yours. <laughs> the University of Groningen and um, perhaps we can already go on to the the next slide and you know this bridge is the longest bridge in Southeast Asia and for us this is a symbol of our desire not only to span uh, between the Netherlands Europe and um, Southeast Asia and Indonesia, but also within the region that we're quite interested in comparative work. So, so far within our Southeast Asia uh, Institute, we've had uh, 23 um, scholars, PhD uh, researchers. These have mainly been Indonesians, but now also include um, scholars from uh, Thailand and Vietnam and, and beyond. Um, our PhDs from Indonesia 
um, have tended to be either existing uh, lecturers with Indonesian universities or civil servants, for example, in the home ministry or the, um, the planning ministry, uh, uh, Bapanis, or others that have you know, significant uh, work uh, beyond their, their master degree. Okay, let's go on to the next slide, please. I think when you're beginning to think about what you want to do uh, research on and when you begin to look for a university and a research team uh, in the Netherlands, try to first think about your own prior experience. What is your um, disciplinary focus uh, from the past in your bachelor degree and in your master's studies? Um, what kind of uh, jobs have you been doing, your own life experience? So make sure that what you're proposing in your PhD builds on uh, your prior academic studies and your own uh, past. I think one of the things oftentimes we see people propose sort of topics to us, but remember that you need to place it in a wider disciplinary or transdisciplinary field. And so try to think about also what the current theoretical debates are in that field. Uh, Professor Tucker talked about um, how important it is in our PhD trajectory. We try to encourage four um, uh, research articles. And uh, to get published, it needs to be uh, placed within the current um, theoretical uh, debate. Suzanne is gonna re-get the, the slide back uh, up. You know, the next topic here when you're thinking about your research is, especially for the PhD, you have to think about what is new and innovative. So we are on that third slide there, that one, yes. So if you could make that slide fill the screen now. So we are on this line about new and innovative about the proposed research for both science and society. You know, one of the things that the Netherlands has really taken a lead in is we don't just want to produce research of the highest scientific quality, which is a must, but we're also very interested in what the societal impact of your research is. So it's good to think about that. When you're developing a research question, it's not only what the significance of that question for science, but also for society. So those first um, four remarks are about sort of your own experience. And then the second part is to begin to look out at European and especially Dutch universities to find a particular research group or team that you think your research would fit uh, within. And um, also begin to identify scholarship and funding opportunities for your research. This may be uh, European, Netherlands funds. They could also be uh, Indonesian uh, funds. Okay, next slide, please. You know, when we receive the, these um, research uh, proposals, it's good that you have sort of um, different length versions. You know, it's good to be able to have a paragraph where you summarize your um, uh, proposed research, then it's uh, fast for a professor to be able to see, is that a topic that they are interested in that focused in? And then you can also then attach the longer, let's say five to seven page uh, uh, document. I also would urge you to consider the priorities of the scholarship sponsor, because usually you can kind of steer the way you write your proposal to make it interesting for 
the scholarship provider. Um, this, for example, reaches back to when we talked about the impact uh, of your research. And of course, for example, the Indonesian scholarship opportunities, they are quite interested in how this fits in with um, uh, priorities of the government and society. Okay, next slide, please. So I think, you know, this is kind of a typical structure that we, we see in journal uh, articles. And it's also a good structure in terms of your research proposal when you're applying to do a PhD. My suggestion is to start with a um, just a two paragraph introduction. The first paragraph being about sort of the topic that you're proposing, why it's interesting, but then right away in the second paragraph, putting the theoretical basis um, there so that we know that you can link this topic to a wider um, theoretical and disciplinary uh, field. Then very quickly after that introduction to pose your research question or perhaps sub questions um, and build a paragraph uh, around this where perhaps you want to define some of the terms that you've used or you limit it to a certain uh, a decade uh, something like that then something that i think is very important and this is something that we also when we propose for example uh, to have funded research by the dutch nwo they ask us right away well Good research question, but what is your scientific and social significance of the research question? So I think it's good here at the beginning to already have one paragraph about the scientific significance, what's new and innovative about your research, and also the social significance of this. The next section should be a short methodology section. So this doesn't go into full detail about all the methodology, but think of sort of categories. Are you proposing a case study or are you proposing longitudinal uh, research where you might be um, comparing different points in time? Perhaps you're proposing comparative research that reaches beyond Indonesia, for example, to what other countries in a similar situation perhaps in Southeast Asia are doing. Here is also where you might say, well, are you going to be doing um, a survey analysis or um, interview uh, techniques, um, various scientific uh, methodologies, quantitative techniques? So you sort of briefly introduce, well, what kind of methods are you going to use? The next part is very important and is a, a real um, larger part now of the proposal, but the sort of theoretical overview and literature review. So look at the international literature, get the debates, try to figure out how your question fits in with current debates in the field and in your literature review is also your opportunity to say well there's also likely some indonesian research already on the topic cite that research in either english or indonesian um, so it's both a theoretical overview and also what has already been published in the topic that you are uh, proposing the next significant section of the proposal is the analysis. And here, at this point, it's sort of going into more detail of how you're gonna do your research. So you've sort of briefly introduced your methodology earlier on, but here you're really going to um, define what kind of documents you're going to look at, what kind of interviews are you proposing to uh, conduct. Um, you might even at this point give a little sort of pilot study or an example of a smaller part of the research to give us a flavor of what you are proposing to do. 
And finally, in the conclusion, then try to remember you're trying to link up the theory that you're proposing to use and your own um, analysis. So this is a typical structure for a scientific uh, paper, and it makes it uh, very clear to a reviewing committee of the research that you're um, proposing. Okay, let's go on to the next slide, please. I wanted to talk a little bit about how you might think about your research and linking it up to major scientific policy or societal agendas. So for example, in my research team here in Groningen, we're focused on governance uh, issues. And oftentimes you can link those governance issues to certain of the sustainable development goals. So Indonesia, for example, um, has proposed a, um, they have the voluntary national review um, where they have outlined their goals and their targets and their indicators for what they want to achieve by 2030 on a whole range of topics. So 17 SDGs, um, social goals, economic goals, environmental goals, climate goals. This is a way to make your research that may be connected to one of those goals, but how it's part of a wider uh, sustainable development agenda um, of Indonesia, of ASEAN, and of the United Nations. Indonesia has been a real leader in regional integration issues, one of the founding members of ASEAN. So you might think about sort of multi-level governance issues and how ASEAN is involved or could be uh, involved. Climate change, both mitigation and adaptation is very large on the international uh, agenda. So linking your research to some aspect of climate change has been a real um, focus here at the University of Groningen, and that would also be um, help fit your topic into a larger uh, field. Um, also, th this part of sustainable and resilient development. And finally, I wanted to put stress on thinking about possibly doing comparative uh, research. Um, for example, one of my PhD candidates is uh, defending her dissertation soon now and she's looking at inequality in mobility and she did her research both in jakarta and in kuala lumpur um, so think about comparative research and also think about implementation challenges so you know there's policies and we all know that um, nations we spend a lot of time thinking about good policies but the implementation, and often the implementation has to happen at the provincial level or local level within cities, and citizens are involved in that process. So uh, think about implementation challenges. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, so th these are uh, the 17 uh, SDG goals. Um, in our planning department, for example, at the University of Groningen, a lot to focus here on SDG 11, on sustainable cities and communities. Um, one of the things I find now that the, uh, after the Paris climate talks, you know, we also have SDG 13 on climate action. So it's an integrated uh, approach looking at um, no poverty, zero hunger, but also economic growth with reduced inequalities and then these sort of environmental um, uh, goals uh, as well. So try to think about if your topic perhaps fit into some of the research about these particular SDGs. Um, next slide, please. Um, here is some work where we're doing looking at synergies between the sustainable development of goals and climate change agendas 
And here again, on the right side of the drawing, you see this interest both in scientific inquiry and societal aspirations, societal impact. Um, so that's the kind of research that we're uh, especially interested in uh, pursuing here. All right, I think there's a couple more slides to finish off here. Next slide, please. You know, this uh, picture from Indonesia, I have always found very moving. Um, children playing um, um, in a village setting, but they're connected through this large um, television um, uh, uh, antenna in the background connected to the world. So this focus on people and the impact that our research has on communities and uh, people, I think are very important and something we um, shouldn't forget. Okay, next slide. Um, this was a, uh, a book that um, I uh, worked on with a series of professors across Southeast Asia that uh, I edited also with my colleague Adafri Agusalam at Gajah Mada University. I wanted to show that to you. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a book that is uh, coming out in December now uh, based on research of our PhD uh, teams that was edited by myself and my colleague uh, Wendy uh, Tan. Um, and next slide, please. That one we already saw. And yeah, I just wanted to show you our uh, main um, a building and I always bring students up my first meeting with them up to the aula which is the large auditorium where we have our PhD defenses which are just above that uh, portal there um, and you see all the bicycles everybody um, bikes uh, in this country rain or shine and um, yeah I guess I did want to say that one of the things that we've really made a big effort at the University of Groningen is making sure that we have both women and men PhD candidates. We also make sure that their families are welcome, their children are in the Dutch schools. Um, so there's really a whole uh, group of um, over 300 uh, Indonesians that are in um, Groningen uh, connected to the university one way or, or another. And just a couple final sh shots of our uh, city, then one of the, um, and there's the final picture. I know it's evening and just getting dark in Indonesia. So that is one of our canals in Groningen with the, with the bikes ready to head home. So thank you, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Professor Rosaker. Uh, so we already have uh, all of our uh, speakers. So and I already have a list of questions that needs to be answered. So yeah, we shall uh, start the Q&A sessions. So first, there is a um, uh, questions. Uh, I think it should be addressed to uh, Professor uh, Holzacker and Professor Tucker. The question is, how do usually PhD students find uh, their research contribution or novelty? Do supervisors give them guidance or the topic suggestions? Or the PhD students will try to find the novelty independently? So maybe Professor Holsecker can give us first. You know, I guess there are, thank you for the, the question. There's really two models here. So sometimes uh, a Dutch professor or a team has uh, put in a research proposal and is hiring you know, a group of PhDs for a particular uh, project. And then the student, um, the prospective PhD candidate mm -hmm. needs to fit their ideas into this larger project. Um, but the other way and the more typical way is the candidate comes up with the with the proposal and then um, 
looks around, looks at what literature has been published, which professor in the Netherlands has been publishing in this uh, area. Um, so it was really doing uh, searches and trying to find um, potential supervisors. When I get applications in as part of our Southeast Asia Center, then I reach out and I think, oh, maybe we should do a co-supervision with the law faculty, for example. And then I reach out to the law faculty and say, hey, I have this interesting proposal, or I reach out to the economics uh, faculty. And normally I can already give initial feedback to the student and say, you know, maybe before we go on and find another supervisor, an additional co-supervisor, here are some suggestions I can already give at this point to make your proposal better. So Professor Tucker, maybe you can add on to some of those ideas. Yeah, what shall I say? I think it, it is always a bit of a combination. And mm -hmm. frankly, I am most uh, pleased with PhDs that develop their own research questions. Of course, sometimes well, it has to fit in the scope of my institute. Sometimes it is a project and it has to fit in the scope of the project. Uh, but I think, frankly, if I have to think in detail out the research question and the methodology that the PhD has to answer, that's a bit, uh, that goes too far. The PhD is about depending your own, uh, developing your own thinking and all those kind of things. And I should help you to develop your critical thinking, to guide you a little bit like that's not all, that's not. But in the end, you should be able to find it out yourself. So that is the typical kind of co-production that you have between your supervised professional and uh, and PhD students. Okay, yeah, thank you for your uh, answer. So following that questions, uh, there also someone who wants to ask to Professor Hoseker, because you mentioned that uh, there are some possibilities that you work on uh, your research proposal or your thesis with the with other co-supervisor. So is it possible to have a uh, supervisor or co-supervisor from different universities or maybe just different uh, 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 department in one university or is it also possible for uh, different universities? Okay, let me start with that and then I see Professor Tucker also wants to uh, add something. Mm -hmm. um, you yeah. know, typically a PhD candidate comes to one university and, um, but what I try to do is to emphasize interdisciplinary, interfaculty cooperation. So oftentimes then it is also with an additional uh, faculty member from a different, um, a different faculty. That's sort of unusual in the Dutch uh, context, but I think it works very well for the kind of um, transdisciplinary research that we're trying to encourage. The other way that is um, uh, might be possible is also to think about a, a sandwich um, double degree where part of the research is done at an Indonesian university and part in a Netherlands university. And sometimes that um, then those two universities and can cooperate with part of the supervision in Indonesia and part of it in the Netherlands. Professor Tucker. Yeah, if I can ask you that. I think in a way, my university is very simple. We can appoint maximum two professors and maximum two supervisors that don't have a professor title. Where they come from, that's all fine. A graduate school, of course, the oh, need to be a lead professor from my university. So that is all for me. But let me give two examples. Uh, in my slides, I indicated you two people from uh, uh, Universitas Patriciarang in Bandung mm -hmm. that work with me. Uh, Amira Alishibana is still a professor in Bandung. Well, we made an arrangement that she is formally the co promoter with me, or the, the second promoter with me. Under the Leiden Graduate School, the Leiden Graduate School has appointed her. Uh, for uh, the other student, uh, we basically have an arrangement uh, with uh, with Irland. We basically, yeah, he wants to do dynamic modeling. There is a very good professor also at Universitas Patriciarum called Arif Yusuf, mm -hmm. and he becomes the co-promoter. 
uh, with us. So we can, we can, and that it's still, they both will graduate in light and we don't have a kind of complicated like uh, dual promotion or something like that. It will be a light PhD, but I can invite promotors from all the universities, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you for enlightening us. And also I have a question for uh, Dr. Peter. So is there any plan for uh, maybe Nufik Neso to have a program, a scholarship program like a Stunet or OKP, like previous OKP for PhD? Uh, I wish there was, um, but uh, the reality is that uh, Nufik at this point in time is not directly managing uh, scholarships for PhDs. We do manage scholarships for uh, master degrees. Uh, in Indonesia, we have the student program, uh, which is ongoing. Uh, and also the Orange Knowledge program uh, has opportunities for uh, scholarships, but not for PhDs. So we facilitate the connection uh, with Dutch universities and with the options, uh, some of uh, which have passed uh, by in my presentation and have also been mentioned by Professor Tucker and Professor Holzacker. Um, so uh, there is no direct financing from Nifik Neso for PhDs at this point in time. We can only help you to find sources and to facilitate. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Peter. Peter, Peter uh, I wonder if you might mm -hmm. talk a little bit about the um, Erasmus Center and how um, a number of Dutch universities, including Groningen, have established um, uh, a program that helps people with their English sure. and preparing a proposal. And I think that that's been very sure, helpful. Sure. And that involves actually uh, Leiden University, uh, Professor Tucker's University is Groningen, uh, and the Free University Amsterdam. So that we we uh, that is not directly in the Vignese, but we help the Erasmus Thales Centrum, the Dutch Language Center in the Dutch Embassy in Jakarta, to um, develop a program that supports people uh, to prepare themselves to do a PhD in the Netherlands, uh, and that includes uh, you know much broader versions of what Professor Holzacker just did in a nutshell talk you through what is necessary to write a good proposal, plus a host of other things. Um, we had that uh, last year for the first time. It was a really successful event, so it will certainly be repeated. Um, so yes, in that sense, but for me also that is facilitation of PhD research in the Netherlands. And the question was on whether we manage financing. We do not directly manage financing, but facilitation, we do whatever we can to help people to find. We also do matchmaking, for example, if NWO has a call, a tender a call for proposals, uh, like most recently for proposals in the field of renewable energy, yeah, very much related to the SDGs, to challenges of climate change. Uh, then we may organize a session for Indonesian researchers to meet potential collaborators from the Netherlands uh, so that they can write a proposal together. So you can call upon us for that kind of help. Okay, thank you, Dr. Peter, for adding. Uh, now we have an inter interesting questions. So uh, maybe this one is for Professor Hosecker and Professor Tucker. Is it possible for someone who already have a PhD, but she or he wants to have another PhD in the Netherlands? I can be very short about it. No, it is by law forbidden in the Netherlands to award a PhD if someone already has a PhD. So yes, oh. I have Chinese uh, students where we managed, oh. but we carefully made sure they were in a PhD trajectory in China and also in a PhD trajectory that they graduated first in the Netherlands and then they still could graduate in China because China didn't have that rule. But I literally was in a committee with one of the former rectors. He was chairing this, the, 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 the award, and it was after the awards, in the award ceremony, after the defense. And I was saying, she is also doing a PhD trajectory in China. And he was saying, did she already graduate there? 
And I said, no, don't calm down. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> but that was very important. Otherwise, we could not have awarded the PhD. Yeah. Oh, so see. unfortunately not. No. If you have a PhD, don't go to the Netherlands. We cannot award you. Okay, so so that means, yeah, so that means for um, this person, you know, to think about uh, postdoc uh, opportunities uh, or faculty exchange uh, between Indonesia and the Netherlands. So, um, yeah, thinking um, other structures um, that are there, postdoc or um, um, visiting. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Okay, uh, we have another questions. Uh, maybe this is more uh, technical for uh, Professor Poseker or Professor Tucker. So is there any requirement for a PhD or maybe even a postdoc uh, requirement for publications? Is it has to be like someone has to be published their article in Q1 or Q2 uh, uh, journal maybe? Yeah, let me say how I do this. Mm -hmm. um, for the PhD, it uh, depends a bit on the university, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. What we do in Leiden, we say you have to do four papers during your PhD. When I uh, accept a PhD candidate, I look at can the person write very well, is it a good thinker, can the person mm -hmm. structure. Of course, it helps if during your master you already have written papers. But to be honest, I think we have every year now 100 students in our master program. If maybe five or ten write a paper, that is a lot. In China, that is different. Many of the top universities in China, if you do a master's, you write a paper. But I would say, I, for me, it's fine if a PhD a candidate hasn't written any paper yet. But you must convince me that you can learn that quickly and that kind of things. For a postdoc, again, it is like it is logical that you have written a number of papers and published it. Uh, and if it's Q1 or whatever, I don't care that much. I look at the quality of the paper. Uh, and then how many, I don't care. It is more, if I see that you do terrific work, uh, then probably I can accept you if, if you have the money. But that's a bit how it works for me. I see. But maybe for Professor Holtzacker, it's different, I don't know. So Professor Holtzacker, want to add something? Yeah, so the University of Groningen also um, the typical approach is four um, uh, articles. And what I guess I want to say about these ratings is that on, um, we certainly want to get into re, you know, excellent regional um, journals, Asia Pacific, Southeast Asia. So it needs to go above just sort of national journals or you know internal university publications. Um, but especially in the social sciences, it might be that you know the top level journals are mainly interested in what's happening in the United States or mainly in Europe. Um, so publishing also in you know Asia Pacific or Southeast Asia journals is perfectly acceptable to us. Okay, I see. So it doesn't have any strict uh, uh, like requirement uh, with the Q1 and Q2. At least if you already like publish an article, even maybe it's a conference, maybe it also can be considered, right? And yeah, we also have another question for uh, Dr. Peter. So there's someone who wants to know if uh, he wants to have uh, access to research funding from NWO. Do we always have to have a partner in the Netherlands? If so, is the research proposal prepared by partner or by us? Um, the answer to that question is that uh, in most cases, uh, NWO sets out tenders uh, specifically for Indonesia. Um, and that uh, has to involve a Dutch research institution in collaboration with Indonesian researchers. The proposal is prepared jointly. Uh, it's not uh, dictated from the Netherlands or so. That is done in collaboration and that is also why we sometimes organize these matchmaking events. 
to make sure that the right people from both countries can meet each other uh, in order to form that collaboration. So uh, if you join in that session as an individual researcher or as an institute, you will collaborate with Dutch colleagues to write a proposal and have all opportunities to have your input. Okay, thank you, Dr. Peter. So I will take, uh, yeah. Maybe I can also say something okay. uh, about that. Um, you know, Peter had mentioned earlier the NWO uh, cooperation with Indonesia on uh, mm -hmm. uh, energy. And this year, then, that an application process that just closed is cooperation um, NWO and uh, RISTEC, BRIN in Indonesia, on cooperation Indonesia Netherlands on regional planning and sustainable urbanization. For example, in Groningen, um, I work closely with Gajamada University and ITB and um, the University of Indonesia. And we have made a proposal about corridor development in Indonesia, including in the new capital region, Kalimantan. Um, and I know Leiden put in a proposal, Nijmegen put into a proposal. So, you know, starting sometime January, February, early next year, then there'll be um, um, that research decisions will be made and a number of Dutch universities will be involved and a number of Indonesian universities on um, regional planning and sustainable urbanization. Thank James. We might have lo lost James exactly. Uh, let's yeah. see whether he comes back. I um, mean, it is a quarter past eight. I would think maybe we'll come to a close if James is not coming back. We have a, a lot mm -hmm. more questions, but I would yeah. suggest that uh, I will share those questions with you via email. Oh, James is back. James, do you want to ask one final question maybe before we close for today? Well, I think we have an internet problem in Jakarta, but that doesn't matter. Um, I think that was a fabulous session. I have learned a lot from this, and I think so have our audience members. Just to recap, we will share the slides of our three presenters. We will share the recording. And of course, in the slides, you have the contact details of all our three pre presenters today. So whenever you have questions that have not been answered today, I'm sure they're more than willing to um, give you an answer via email. But as I said at the beginning, Euraxis ASEAN is here in the region. We're always here to just uh, support you with your questions. And of course, Peter is in Jakarta. He is your primary contact person, anything related to research in the Netherlands. And I think with this, it's time to just thank all of you that was really excellent. I have some great news. I've just been looking at the statistics. You had the best um, audience attendance rate of all webinars so far. Mm. And I'm not surprised because it was absolutely fabulous. So thank you so much. I'm sure our participants look forward to the recording and to also share it widely with their uh, peers because this is really, really very helpful advice. So with this, thank you so much. Uh, I hope you all stay safe and healthy and please do explore the opportunities that you've heard about today. Thanks so much and uh, good night, everyone. Bye. Good night. Bye.